Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about nuclear energy and how some of the nuclear reactions we are used uh, we, we have talked about can be used to produce energy. So let's go ahead and get started here. And we want to first of all look at the transmutation of elements. Now we've talked a little bit about this, but what this is is the ways of converting one nucleide to another. So we can look at an example if we take ordinary nitrogen atoms and bombard them with helium nuclei, we can then form oxygen atoms. So we have converted nitrogen into oxygen. And then we have, of course, one hydrogen, one proton left over. Now again, make sure everything you always want to make sure everything balances and you'll note that the mass numbers are 18 on the left and 18 on the right. And the, the atomic numbers are nine on the, the left and nine on the right. So it always makes sure that everything balances. The thing is that these require very high energies. You can't just throw helium at them or mix helium and nitrogen as you can with a chemical reaction. So you can't just take a gas of helium and a gas nitrogen and mix those two together and expect oxygen to come out. You have to bombard them at extremely high velocities and with very high energies using things like particle accelerators. Now the next thing we want to look at are what we call the transuranium elements. Now we know that uranium with an atomic number of 92 is the heaviest that element that occurs in nature. However, we can produce some of these artificially, we can produce heavier elements with a higher atomic numbers. So we can take things like uranium 238 and bombard it with neutrons. If we do that, we would add one to the mass number making it uranium 230. 39. However, uranium 239 is unstable and decays with a half life of about 23 and a half minutes. Doing that, it will give off here an electron. So an electron is then given off. And what we get is a new element with one, uh, one more proton, it will actually form what we call neptunium. And then that decays with a half life of 2.3 days and that decays again through giving off an electron meaning that it adds a proton to its nucleus and becomes plutonium. So by bombarding uranium we can actually make plutonium over the course of a few days as the things begin to decay. So we will make it start off with a heavier isotope of uranium and that will decay through electron emission by and create elements with a even higher mass number than the ones we are used to in the periodic table. Now we've created a number of these and here's a table from your textbook showing some of them with atomic numbers of 95 up through 107 and what kind of reactions. So you can see that different types of nuclei are used. You can use things like bombarding with neutrons which are done in a few cases but you can also use helium nuclei to create some of these here and even heavier elements such as bombarding things with carbon or even with iron to create some of these higher uh, atomic number elements. Now these are all unstable. We have not reached a level where any of these will ever be will be stable again. And they will all decay generally with very, very short half lives. But we are able to create some of these heavier elements in the laboratory. So let's go ahead and look at nuclear fission here and nuclear fission occurs when heavier elements decompose into more stable elements that have a lower mass. So this is something that is not normally a natural occurrence. And that does not mean that the elements do not decay by the ordinary alpha and beta decays that we've talked about previously. But this is actually a splitting of one heavy nucleus into two similar nuclei of much lower mass. So we can do this by bombarding nuclei with neutrons. So by sending neutrons in here, we can take uranium 235, make it the unstable uranium 236, which then splits apart into two pieces, one of krypton and one of barium.
and several neutrons as well. And we can write our equation here and again make sure double check it and I challenge you take a look and make sure everything balances that if you add the mass numbers and the charges that they should be the same on each side of this equation because remember we have to conserve mass and we have to conserve the mass number and we have to conserve the charge. And what we do find is that there will be a mass difference, not in the mass numbers, but in the actual mass of the products that will yield energy by Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. So that is where the energy is coming from. Note these neutrons because they are important because they can keep the cycle going by going back and bombarding another nucleus of uranium 235 and continuing the chain reaction. Now in order to do this you do need a critical amount of material and that's what we call the critical mass. Those free neutrons that are produced can continue to cause fission of other nuclei. So we can start with one that splits out but that one forms three neutrons which can then strike three more uranium 235 nuclei and cause them to split forming again more neutrons. So this is what we mean by fissile or fissionable material. It is material that is capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction. In other words, it'll produce enough material, enough neutrons to be able to continue the reaction. If not enough neutrons are produced, then, the, then it would fizzle out and the reaction would stop. So this would then be a way to be able to have this continue on by having a sufficient number and having what we call the critical mass. And the critical mass simply means that the number of neutrons produced exceeds the number of neutrons absorbed. So we have more and more neutrons available each time. And once you have a critical amount of the material that will happen. So a very small amount of uranium 235 will not undergo a chain reaction. It cannot continue and the neutrons will eventually just fade out and nothing and no further reactions will occur. If you have that critical amount, then the chain reaction can continue. And that's what we use in things like a fission reactor. In a fission reactor, we have uh, control rods that are here in the black, and those will allow to us to control the reaction uh, to keep things here. So uranium 235 is used as a nuclear fuel and it can be enriched to about 5%. This means you have enough uranium in the fuel rods here that you can produce energy. You can create a chain reaction. However, it is not what we would call supercritical, and that's what we would need in order for it to explode. So a nuclear reactor cannot explode like an atomic bomb. And it so because it can never build up the supercritical mass to completely have that runaway explosion. Now that does not mean it cannot melt down or that there are not other potential issues. But a nuclear reactor no matter what you do to it is not going to actually explode like a nuclear bomb. And these control rods that we talk about are used. They are things that like to absorb neutrons. So you can insert them. They absorb a lot of the neutrons and therefore minimize the reaction. So you can control the reaction by using the control rods. When you pull them out, you can get more reaction going. As you push them in, that will slow down the amount of the reaction. So this is the type of thing that is used in a nuclear reactor that are you nuclear reactors that are used to produce energy. Now the other type of nuclear reactions are fission reactions. Fission reactions occur when you convert night light nuclei into heavier nuclei. This is what our sun does. So our sun takes four hydrogen atoms to create one helium atom and two electrons. So again, double check this, make sure that the masses and the charges balance on both sides. And again, don't forget that there are coefficients in front, but you should look and see that that should balance correctly. There is a difference in mass between these, which is converted to energy by E equals MC squared. That small amount of mass is created, is converted into a large amount of energy. This requires very high temperatures in the order of 10 to 15 million Kelvin. 
So not something that is very easy to do here. So that's something that is difficult to use for nuclear power. Now it can be used in what we call the hydrogen bomb as one of the nuclear weapons that can be used that in the massive explosion that occurs that you can actually get to the point where you actually can undergo fusion reactions. However, in nuclear power, we just don't yet have the way to easily contain the material and keep those very high temperatures. As you might imagine, nothing can survive those temperatures. So things that are talked about magnetic fields, laser beams, the research is still ongoing to bring nuclear fusion into use. Now one of the advantages of nuclear fusion is of course the waste products are less radioactive. You're producing helium out of it instead of radioactive isotopes that need to be stored away as nuclear waste. So there is an advantage to it there. But the difficulties of being able to contain in those very high temperatures that are needed are still a problem. So let's go ahead and finish up here as we do with our summary. And what we look at is we talked about the transmutation of elements and how that can produce energy. And we can do that through either nuclear fission, which splits heavier elements into lighter ones, or nuclear fusion, which combines the lighter elements into heavier elements. Both of these are able to produce energy. So that concludes this lecture on nuclear energy. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in class.